Welcome to the Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Hi everyone, Ross here. I've got a great episode for you today, which is a conversation with Arthur Kay. My name's Arthur Kay. I'm the chief executive of a company called Skyrim, and I'm also the chair of the Key Worker Homes Fund. So Skyrim uh, is a company that builds precision manufactured homes in the airspace above existing buildings, particularly focused in London. And our mission is to deliver beautiful, affordable, sustainable homes for London's key workers. We talk about how increasing density and ensuring that key workers like nurses, firefighters and teachers have access to affordable housing is key to making our cities more sustainable and vibrant. But this isn't just a theory. Arthur and his company Skyroom are actually making this vision a reality here in London. We also discuss why living in cities is far more sustainable than living in the countryside, contrary to what many people believe. And towards the end, we also discuss Arthur's other company called Biobean, which creates biofuels from used coffee grounds. But first, I had to ask him, what does he mean when he says that Skyroom builds homes in the airspace above buildings? So when you say airspace, you don't mean floating. You mean... <laughs> <laughs> maybe one day, maybe one day. <laughs> um, but, but no, we mean... So we've developed something called that we call a podium system. Uh, so it allows us to not have to decant existing residents and also mm. to circumvent existing building structure, services and access. And that's essentially allows us to build in the airspace above a whole load of existing buildings. So typically anywhere between two and six stories. Um, And so it really means that you can provide what we refer to as incremental density in places that may have been Mm -hmm. developed um, at a different part in terms of of the the journey of the city. So in the case of London, where we're based, um, London's still seen as a relatively low density city when compared to other major North American and European cities. And so, but also a lot of the stock of housing in London is either very um, valuable or still of architectural mm. significance or um, has got people living in them and isn't, shouldn't be knocked down or have to go through full on regeneration. And so we're trying to look at it from the sense right. of saying, how can we rely on the existing uh, buildings that are there, but also incrementally add density to the city? We're basically trying to say that it doesn't have to be a two-story terrace or a 40-story skyscraper, there is another way. (laughs) Hmm. It's it's something I've said many times, I've probably said it on this podcast as well, is that in Britain in particular, there's this sort of, we we seem to go from two and three-story terraces up to skyscrapers with very little in between quite often. And even with new developments, when you have like large master plan sites, you still get that sort of a couple of two-story, you know, a row of terraces and then like a 20-story building. And you're like, there's something in between here that we're missing that you see all over Europe. Why why don't we do it, you know? You're right. It's, it's bizarre. And it's also interesting because some of the, mo- the places that we enjoy the most, not just as cities around Europe, but also the most popular parts and most expensive parts of London. So thinking of areas like Notting Hill and Pimlico, which are very, very expensive and mm. seen by many as desirable places to live, are actually full of mid-rise buildings and are the densest part of the city because i think you know your listeners will know but not not and many people assume that density equals tower whereas actually you know i'm sure you've seen those kind of architects architectural grids of you can actually get as many people in terms of density into a block of mid-rise as you can tower with green space around it and that's really what um yeah i think a lot of people and a lot of your listeners i'm sure are kind of beginning to think that the future of urbanism is about that um, mix of typologies rather than either you know rows and rows of terrace houses or skyscraper green space skyscraper green space this sort of concept of you know why don't we just add stories to existing structures it's sort of i mean it's one of those ideas that you hear about where people say this is such a good idea why why don't we do it it's almost like something you would do for like a master's thesis or something and then you think oh well that was nice but let's go back to the real world you know so what were some of the challenges you had to overcome to sort of make this actually a reality? 
No, you're, you're exactly right, Ross. I mean, it sits somewhere between, as we see it, I, I trained as an architect at UCL, the Bartlett's, which is, is exactly the kind of project that a, a Bartlett <laughs> kind of a postgrad comes up with in terms of, and, but also it's a typology that has existed for hundreds of years. You know, the mansard mm. roof is an, is a rooftop extension. The penthouse is a rooftop extension. So it's definitely not new in the sense of that we've been adding stories to buildings for a very, very long time. The difficult thing and the complex part of it is how do you add not one or two stories, but between two and six stories, Mm. number one. And then number two, how do you do so at a scale that makes it worthwhile as a genuine solution to the housing crisis rather than, you know, at the moment in London, um, if you were to go around and add one story to a few buildings in zone one, you could (laughs) make a very, very healthy living as a boutique developer um, selling mm. under your section 106 obligations six to you know four five six seven eight um, luxury penthouses for five million right. quid each um, it's a, it gets much 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 more complex if you're thinking around how do you build two to six stories developments of between 15 and 100 homes for i mean our particular focus is right. around delivering affordable homes for key workers and that's really where okay. we believe there's a big opportunity, but also a really, really exciting one in terms of you know, what can actually be you know, make an impact for for the city. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier about you know you've you've sort of developed this uh, structural system, and and I get, I understand now why you say airspace because it sounds like the existing building is not supporting at least all of the weight of the the upward extension. Is that right? Exactly. So the, the the big constraints that we found when we started surveying buildings in and around London was that the biggest one was uh, the community who already live there. So existing residents and the huge disruption that some forms of this development uh, has on existing residents. The second one was the structural integrity of a building, uh, not only what it could actually take, but also, right. frankly, what a structural engineer would be comfortable signing off that it could take. <laughs> um, <laughs> third, <laughs> which, which don't always match up. And then thirdly is um, <laughs> things around um, you know, access and services. So how do you get up there safely? How do you get down safely? How do you ensure disabled access? How do you get um, you know, waste up and um, uh, waste down and electricity up? And so this system that we developed essentially means that you can open up. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it's suitable for every building. And I think you know, we, we are definitely not proposing this as a solution to plonk on top of every building. It has to mm-hmm. be really thought through from what the area requires what residents in the building want, um, you know, what the correct um, you know, typology and architectural massing is for that that area. And so we, but we, it, what it does do is it removes a whole b- bunch of constraints. It means that sometimes it still may be appropriate to build two stories. We're doing some developments which are two stories. They're in heritage buildings. One, for example, in bang in the middle of zone one, an 1870s building of affordable housing. That is not appropriate to build a you know, five-story tower above but then others you know we've we've just got planning permission for a building in in Southwark in a post-industrial area where we're actually adding four stories in the airspace above a three-story building and with that we're really celebrating the post-industrial heritage of the area exposing the uh, the steel frame of the exoskeleton and podium system for example to try and talk about it and and introduce a new typology to the city rather than historically the mansard roof has been literally disguised as a roof mm. and trying to you know, apologetically you know, submissive in the in the kind of you know architectural terminology it, it sounds like you're taking a bespoke considered approach to every project it's not like a standard product that is just <laughs> whacked on top of anything exactly and that's why we talk about as a as a system and then we use modern methods of construction you know modular homes that can be then applied to that and but it's definitely not saying we got a one size fits all product, and then we're going to plonk it around. It's a system that could be configured in different ways, and you can adapt it to make it suitable and blend in with the existing building, as we're mm-hmm. doing in you know, a conservation area in central London on a heritage asset, versus really wanting to talk about it and express it um, in you know, areas of the city which you know, that's appropriate for. And it's really about working with heritage consultants, architects, incredible engineers okay. to really think of that from you know, each project, as you say, from a bespoke perspective, but having this tool in our toolbox that you could bring to bear if, if you wanted to. Well, have you delivered any any projects already? 
Uh, so at the moment, our first project is uh, the, the one I mentioned in in, in Southwark and Bermondsey. So we're we're about we're starting on site in uh, in autumn. I mean, probably the first first time the planners there and the local council had seen something like this. What was the sort of discussions you were having with them? Was it was it difficult, or did they sort of understand what you were doing? It, it was difficult, um, but I think we were lucky that we had a very very open minded planning committee, and also it's based in Southwark, and Southwark is a real challenge in terms of delivering housing. And so, because, mm-hmm. you know, if we were to be building this as a you know these luxury penthouses, or to be you know framing it more towards uh, office space for sake of arguments, I don't okay. think we'd have the same reception. But our particular mission as a business is really focusing around delivering affordable homes for key workers. And so making sure that, um, you know, now now we need to obviously deliver it as affordable homes for key workers, um, but making sure yeah. that that narrative was clear in the minds of the the, you know, the the planning committee and the planning officers we work with meant that we you know, ended up with a unanimous positive decision when it came to committee. Okay. I, w- I want, because you've mentioned it, I want to to come on to this topic of the key workers. And then I'd like to come back and ask you about the, the sustainability aspect of it. But um, yeah. I mean, in the UK, we're f- very familiar with this term now, key workers. It's really come become part of the public consciousness, I think, during the pandemic. Perhaps for people listening in other parts of the world, I'm not sure if that term is used. Could you just give us a description what what that means? Yeah, so key workers are a term that in the UK typically refers to in government employees, but there's also in different um, definitions, the term essential workers as well, which in the pandemic became increasingly um prevalent and that meant kind of frontline workers and people who were needed in order for us to still function despite in lockdown and the idea of key worker housing has been around for a very very long time and it was actually a popular uh you know tenure of housing until relatively recently and when we actually wrote the white paper uh, the sky and white paper rise up in 2018 um which is i'll send you a copy ross um, and that was specifically, in, you know, it was published in, in 2018 by UCL and with a forward by Richard Rogers. And we, at the time, we were really looking at how you could deliver this new tenure of housing, affordable, sustainable, beautiful homes for key workers near to where they work. And the whole thesis of the white paper was saying, actually, affordable housing, um, the most important people for cities to function are mm. key workers. And we have been taking them for granted yeah. for decades and in order to be able to materially improve the quality of life of key workers, we believe that the way to do that is to allow, give them affordable, sustainable homes that they can live in, in the communities that they already support. So really, you know, to use 2020 terminology, how do we make the 15 minute city a viable option for a key worker to be able to enjoy? Because at the moment, in those reports that came out at the back end of last year um, by the Royal College of Nursing, which showed that the average commute of a nurse working what? in London was two hours and that's on average spending 65% of oh their income God. on housing. And the second biggest cost after housing was cost of travel relating to commuting. So, and you know, if you look at something like teaching, for example, over 52% of London's teachers, I think you're not just leaving London, but leaving the profession. Oh, right. And the main reason cited was cost of housing. So this is a huge issue in terms of how do you, you know, even if we just look at this, totally is like, you know, terrible, not even caring about the yeah. individuals, just thinking about how we as citizens of cities can live. If we want our, our children to be educated, if we want our health to be looked after, if we want to enjoy the benefits of a you know, developed city and, you know, that relies heavily on key workers, we need to make sure we support that hidden infrastructure of the city. Um, and so the way we see it is that one of the few benefits that did in fact come out of <laughs> COVID-19 was the highlighting the plight of key workers because if you actually talk to kind of a firefighter or a nurse or a teacher or a doctor who um was really struggling through that time what i often heard when talking to some of these people was well guys we've kind of been doing yeah. this forever yeah and i'm glad that people are now thanking us and paying attention for us and clapping for us and all the rest of it but actually you know we were doing this in 2019 20, 2009 1999 <laughs> we just didn't get clapped then um, but we were actually doing the hard work <laughs> even then yeah um so, you know, I think it's become more acute and highlighted, but it's always been there. Yeah, it's definitely a group that has kind of fallen between the cracks. Is there no other organizations or or methods of, of getting these people, you know, affordable homes, you know, like social housing, things like that? Well, it's an interesting one. So it depends on um, the country that you're listening from. But in the UK, uh, there's 
typically kind of uh, you know, two, maybe three tenures of, of housing. So there's market housing, then social rent, and then intermediate rent. And so some key workers do qualify for intermediate rent, but very few or none qualify for social rent, typically because almost by definition, they're in stable employment um, and don't have a necessarily a terrible salary, but don't have a very high salary. And so it's a very interesting one in terms of exactly as you said, Ross, they've slipped between the gaps because they're in employment, but they have this weird challenge of having to work in the centre of cities for cities to function. They suffer this this almost unique challenge of very you know needing to be at a certain place at a certain time, which means you have to live near somewhere, and then or, or suffer very long commutes, and or. Um, but then they've had, you know, in the UK, uh, over a decade of austerity. And so you have you know, stagnant salaries and rising house prices. So it's a really specific challenge. And then on top of that, there's no mm. actual group that's lobby specifically for key workers as a group, because you have nurses, doctors, firefighters, all of whom have different unions, all of whom are talking about different priorities. And understandably, it's much simpler to talk about a pay rise for you know, lots of these organisations campaign for pay rises, but what that translates to actually in terms of reality, even if a pay rise rise was granted, is usually you know low single digit percentage pay rises on an annual basis, which right. barely keeps up with cost of inflation. And actually, if you look at some of the data in terms of where key workers are spending well over half their salary, typically between fifty five and seventy percent, depending on um, which bracket they're in. Um, mm actually a much more effective way to deliver more disposable income for key workers and a better quality of life for key workers, which are the two kind of metrics which a pay rise attempts to deliver. Actually, if you can make housing much more affordable for them, put it, put that housing in places where they actually want to live and it's less expensive commutes, mm. you can deliver that same, a much greater end benefit, but without a lot of the, um, you know, the costs associated with the pay rise. Yeah, I think the location aspect of it is really key because even if you qualify for social housing, you, you sort of have to take what you can get. And and many local authorities now are, you know, moving their, their social housing further and further out to less, uh, well, where, where there's less expensive land and where they can, you know, can actually build it. Exactly. And, and frankly, at, you know, there's already, you know, depending on where you live, there's usually, you know, over 10,000 people on the local authority's housing waiting list as is. So, so suddenly adding, you know, in London, there's almost 1 million key workers supporting oh, yeah. 9 million Londoners or whatever we're at. So it's not, it's not exactly going to kind of solve anything if we say, right, <laughs> just add them to the social housing waiting lists. Because um, firstly, they wouldn't qualify. And secondly, um, you know, count, local authorities, although they're doing a fantastic job in most cases, are, are really struggling to deliver their existing yeah. pipelines, let alone trying to also house a million key workers. Yeah. So, so is this where the Key Workers Fund comes in? Exactly. So um, in the back end of last year, we launched something called the Key Worker Homes Fund. So that's we, ju- we raised just over £100 million, um, and that's being used to accelerate the delivery of um, building some of these homes, the homes that the key workers so desperately need. And it's definitely not a silver bullet. £100 million goes a way to deliver homes to key workers, and we can leverage that by bringing that's equity so we can bring debt into the equation and also the whole concept behind Scrum is around partnering with local authorities and housing associations so that involves minimizing or taking out the land value we're not actually buying lands or developing land we're providing financing technology and pro bono consultancy to help deliver these homes but we're not actually going to be uh, taking on land so the land goes into the um, appraisal as a you know peppercorn and so but the funding was actually partially in response to a homes for heroes report that was published by the g15 last summer in you know talking about how we do need to deliver these homes it asked governments and the private sector to come together to finance the delivery of more homes for key workers the government is yet to step up but we thought that actually this is a great opportunity to you know um, um, you know we published this white paper in 2018 you know, we need to, if we're going to be talking about homes keeper workers, we need to be putting our money where our mouth is. And so this hundred million pounds is the first step, a small step, but a step in the direction of saying, actually, let's go and deliver these. We need, we need some people to go out and just start building because otherwise we'll be looking at the kind of 
in 10 years' time, we'll still be publishing papers on it rather than delivering homes. <laughs> Yeah, I've, absolutely. I mean, that's something I find so inspiring about Skyrim is that you've taken this sort of what if, you know, this big what if thing is like, what if we could provide homes, affordable homes for key workers in the, as you say, the airspace above buildings. And then you've actually, you know, the fact that you've actually made it a reality is amazing because it sounds so, uh, I don't know, it sounds so kind of uh, ide- idealistic in a sense. Um, so I mean, yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, how 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 quickly has it taken you from sort of coming up with this idea to actually getting it now, as you say, getting things delivered quite quite soon? Yeah, so it's, it's taken quite a long time. I first came up with the idea actually when I was running another company, Biobean, um, and I was thinking. So Biobean is a company that um, is a renewable energy business, and so thinking of it from the perspective it had a you know when we think of triple bottom line businesses of trying to deliver economic impact, social impact, and environmental impact. I felt that it did very well two out of the three. So it did, it was a you know, environmental business and it was you know, for profit. And so I was, but I was really interested in trying to um, deliver something that could truly be called a triple bottom line business that could deliver environmental, mm-hmm. social, and economic impact. And working really closely with some of the team at uh, UCL's Institute for Global Prosperity, came up with this idea it's for Skyrim and then and that was and then I say then you know started working on it published the white paper and that was probably 2017 published the white paper in September 2018 and then formally set up as a business later that year and have been working for the last three years we you know we're, we're proud to kind of have partnered with you know dozens of well over a dozen local authorities in London and also working with some amazing housing associations and in our pipeline we've got couple of hundred homes um, that's definitely not going to be enough to even make a dent in this but our ambition over the next decade is to deliver 10,000 homes for London's key workers wow. so we're really trying to kind of scale up quite quickly once we get these first um, first project the first one that I mentioned for example is 15 homes over four stories um, in in South London in Southwark um, but what we want to do is start looking at more strategic uh, developments so we're working with a few local authorities on a statewide regeneration where you can deliver hundreds of homes per estate. And that's really where the business is, is looking to next. Look, okay, obviously we have this idea that densifying cities is is, is generally, you know, uh, people sort of relate density to sustainability quite often. Um, but can you just, I know it's broader than that. It's not just about squeezing in more homes. Uh, can you just give us your sort of argument of why the Skyroom, uh, you know, your your approach is sustainable and, and what that means? Yeah, so I think firstly, I think your listeners would probably equate density to sustainability. But I think you know, when I talk to what I'm going to call lay people, uh, they often don't. And the right. default in people's minds is often that the most sustainable way to live is to get a small cottage in the countryside and get a, a goat and some chickens and live off the land. And... <laughs> Well, so it's very nice for some people to do and uh, to, to play with in terms of actual, if you look at the CO2 impact um, of just a, a standard normal citizen living in a rural or suburban area versus a urban area, regardless, frankly, where you are in the developed world, it typically halves if you are living in the center of a city versus living in suburbia or wow. the countryside. So in the case of the UK, it's typically around... 10 to 11 tonnes CO2 per person down to about 4 to 5 tonnes of CO2 per person, uh, depending on which reports you read. So, but it's a significant, and that, that's reflected across Europe and the United States. Specifically in terms of Skyrim and how we think about sustainability, we really try and think of it as you know, three different um, well, three different uh, buckets, as, as it were. The first is a sustainable land use. The second is sustainability in terms of what the building is actually built out of and how it's built and then the third piece is around uh, the operational use of that building and so firstly in terms of we look at land use the big piece here is around where you're building as i said in, instead of building in a you know the countryside or suburbia you're building uh, in the cent- cent- city center of a city and then even when you get to the center of the city instead of typically a development is a brownfield development would involve there's a piece of land there the building needs to be knocked down and a new building needs to be built 
Um, I know you've had people on the podcast before, Ross, who've spoken about embodied carbon and understanding the full life mm. cycle of a building and the waste that comes from that. And so not demolishing, but building in the airspace above collectively with the land use saves a right. huge amount of carbon um, through that process. So that's sustainable land use, not demolishing and building in places that there's you know, in the centre of cities. Secondly, in terms of how we build it and what it's made out of, is it's using really lightweight, strong materials. It's using uh, recycled materials where possible and also building to uh, passive house standard um, and um, you oh, know, with all the, all the kind of credits that I'm sure your listeners again will be familiar with. And then thirdly, in terms of operational use, um, that's the stuff again around passive house. You know, there's solar uh, power on the buildings and also the things like green roofs and um, building in biodiversity to the projects. In terms of order of importance, in terms of how much CO2 is actually saved at each of those three different buckets, the most important one by an order of magnitude is where you build and not demolishing buildings to build new buildings. So, right. so that's where almost all the CO2 savings will come and Pay, you know, you can have as many solar panels as you want, but the real savings here are around building in centre of cities and not demolishing buildings, but you know, building the airspace above buildings. Brilliant. I, I, I'm just looking at your website here, and you have a great uh, statistic here. So you mentioned about your uh, aim by 2030 to have 10,000 Skyrim homes built. And it says here, these homes will collectively save over 15 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions over their lifetime or the same effect as taking all of London's vehicles off the road for a year? Yeah, well, the, I mean, the, the, the impact is enormous uh, when you add it up to that scale. And so, you know, I'm hoping that by 2030, when, when we have <laughs> delivered these 10,000 homes, that we'll have far fewer vehicles on London's roads in any case. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, we, as, as we move towards a you know, more cycling, walking, and public transport. But uh, in, in the meantime, yeah, that's the ambition. The urban designer in me has, I suppose, well, I suppose if I can play devil's advocate slightly, do you think there's a risk that, you know, rolling this out on a large scale will have a detrimental impact on the character of our cities? You know, we're, as we said, particularly in British cities, we're very used to this sort of two and three story, uh, quite coherent um, historic form. Is, is Do you think people are going to be uh, worried about the, the the urban design implications or the, the the impact on character. I know. I think great question, Ross. And it's definitely not something which we're proposing is applied everywhere or uniformly. Mm. And so the first thing that we always start with within it, with any project and need to bear in mind all this is around existing residents of buildings and local communities around buildings and making sure that any development unlocks tangible benefits to them and they can be economic benefits in terms of reduction in service charge. They can be uh, benefits in terms of improving the existing infrastructure in area. So you know, it could be anything from redoing a lift shaft to adding a green roof for all residents to enjoy to um, adding on balconies to the buildings to just paying, for, you know, if, you know, if someone needs the building to be reclad because of fire safety, simply just paying for that. So there's a whole bunch right. of benefits there that can be unlocked too. But specifically, we look at, look at it from the perspective of heritage and massing. A really, really important thing here is to make sure that we work with fantastic architects on each project, that we're not just going around with our product, the Skyrim product, and plonk it on top of right. buildings regardless of what's there already. It's crucial to work with communities, but also great architects who can say, work with the community to design what the right solution is, but also to understand the heritage of the area, what the correct massing is for the area. So obviously there's the technical elements like right to light and daylight sunlight and going through the the um, what the right massing is, but also trying to understand what the existing building needs or wants in terms of completing it. And it's really think mm -hmm. of it from the perspective of not a subservient piece of massing that is um, you know going to be hidden one story penthouses, but think of it from the perspective of a new typology that we want to be quite proud of and saying this is something for the city to enjoy and is actually an exciting new development for the city rather than being apologetic about it. And we, we're mm. confident in, you know, as long as we have gone through the correct process with residents and have an architect, we would be proud to, you know, have our name associated with, we're confident that with planning committees and um, as we go through the system, this is going to become a big part of the, you know, an important new typology going forward. There's already planning policy in place in the UK to, 
actively encourage upwards extensions. It's only at the moment. Okay. Um, so this permitted development came through last year. I was typically focused around one and two stories, which is not what we do. But the, the direction of travel was definitely around increasing density, making sure that density is incremental density rather than you know, big towers where we started. And yeah. Um, yeah, that, when we're kind of part of that trend. It's very bold because I think there's, you know, there was there are people who would argue that, um, you know, okay, if you're going to add some stories, at least set it back from the building line, make it a co- you know a color that's you know sort of rec- a bit more recessive and that kind of thing. Whereas you're saying, you know, that that's you know not always the right approach. Sometimes you need to be a bit more bold and architectural about it. Is that yes? Sometimes that is the right approach. As I say, I mean, we're doing a, this heritage building, 1870s heritage building in in central London, and that is the approach we're taking there because that is what okay. the, the the building wants. You know, it's a, a beautiful, proud existing building, and it's in on the edge of a conservation area on a busy main road. So we think that is the right approach there. But in other places, it's saying actually something much more exciting and much more of a, a conversation with the area and the surroundings could be a more exciting way to go. So it's, it's more saying, let's have a range of things we can deliver. The ambition is to deliver between two and six mm. stories above existing buildings. That needs to be appropriate for the area, really sensitive, but also make sure that we're not you know, being delivering a two-story or one-story mansard because that's what everyone's done beforehand. And we're trying to say there's another way. And if we're actually going to try okay. and tackle this challenge at scale, we need to think bigger yeah um i want to move on i suppose a bit past um, the skyroom you know the the skyroom topic but just thinking about cities more generally during the last year during the pandemic it certainly changed the way we work and travel and these sort of patterns will will likely continue on in some form um over you know over the coming years and you know there's reports now that potentially uh, up to 10% of London's population has 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 decreased people have left and i think partially that's people you know moving back to their home country uh you know possibly they lost their job during the pandemic but also just people who realized wait a second if i can work from home i don't have to be in the center of the city paying big high rents i'm going to move out to suburbs of the countryside so with in, with those sort of trends happening slightly anti urban trends it seems do you think cities you know, have a place in this sort of post-pandemic world? Do you think they're going to thrive? I cynically put that view down to uh, journalists who by definition can work anywhere because they're knowledge workers <laughs> and also people really needing something to talk about during the pandemic and write about <laughs> during the pandemic. So I, and those of us who study the history of cities and the science of cities, um, I am uh, very, very confident that they will come roaring back Um if anything, it will be a bigger bounce back. I'd recommend as books I've thoroughly enjoyed over the last years, books like uh, The Triumph of the City, I'm sure you're very familiar with, by Edward Glazier, Jeffrey West's writing, um, a physicist uh, on a, a book called Scale by Jeffrey West, and then writings of Richard Florida, uh, in particular The New Urban Crisis. And so I, I think... Yeah, my, my slightly counterintuitive view at the moment is that this is definitely going to be um, a strong future for cities. People don't just come to cities for work. There are a whole bunch of other reasons that cities exist and the economies of scales of cities are enormous. And um, whilst I think it's a very good thing that people have been shown that there's other ways of living and having that option of being able to, especially for knowledge workers, to have some flexibility in work time. and But early stage professionals, younger people, um, have always been the people that cities have been built for. And right. and I think London's going to come back very strong indeed. Yeah, yeah. It was a bit of a leading question because I knew you're a strong <laughs> urbanist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't necessarily think it's like, it's, it's not saying that there aren't huge benefits of other places and that this, you know, the blend is obviously what makes the world an exciting place. So it's not saying let's make all the world a city, but it's more cities can take a lot worse than what we've just had. You know, the fact that you have, um, you can literally drop nuclear bombs on cities. You can kill, you know, the thing, you know, Florence lost one in two people during the black death. You know, you have cities can take a serious pummeling and come back very, very fast indeed. And the great irony of remote work is that the most 
uh, one of the most expensive parts of the world and the place that location is most important of all is the tech capital of Silicon Valley, <laughs> where you'd think that if anyone had got remote work right, it would be people who are literally working on computers all day and often in computing themselves. And there, that's the place where almost everyone needs to be in and around the place of work in order to work effectively there. So counterintuitively, that's the place where it's um, even more extreme in terms of the value of city and uh, uh, urban density has become even more extreme and apparent in the place where counterintuitively, it should be the least um, a useful thing. Yeah. And also uh, human contact is, is greatly underrated, I think. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Before I move on to the final question, is there any anything I've missed or anything you want to bring up while we're here? No? Oh, maybe, maybe maybe a bit around the Key Worker Homes Fund would be interesting just to yeah. kind of tell people a bit more about that. Please, please, yeah. So the Key Worker Homes Fund, um, specifically, we're looking for local authorities and housing associations to apply and they can get funding and pro bono technical support in order to deliver homes for key workers in the airspace above existing buildings. And so we're really pleased we've already got lots and lots of applicants from uh, London-based local authorities and smaller housing associations. But And technically, the applications have now closed. But if uh, people want to get in touch, it's through fund at skyrim.london or you can email me at arthur at skyrim.london. Uh, we can provide... I'd say up to 100 million pounds in funding um, and then plus this pro bono technical support to show you really to, the first step is just to often to find out what value is there that could okay. be unlocked if one wanted to. So to say, okay, I've got this portfolio of buildings. We've developed a geospatial mapping technology. We can very quickly survey and work out where development opportunities exist and what they could be worth and what they could deliver. Are you, are you looking to expand to other cities or perhaps internationally at some point? We're particularly focused on London um, and the UK because there's a huge, huge opportunity just here if we were to be able to yeah. go ahead and unlock even a portion of that. There was a report by WSB and UCL which estimated that if we were to build above London's municipal buildings alone, you could deliver 630,000 new homes. I think that's probably a bit of the top end, but you know we're certainly talking in the, the hundreds of thousands of new homes that could be delivered in, wow. in London alone through this approach. So we're, we're focused here, but what we're looking to develop is a IP portfolio that we can license and work with landlords and developers and technology companies in other cities and then help them to, yeah. and even sometimes fund them to uh, deliver projects in their cities. Because the challenge of affordable housing and the opportunity of underutilized airspace exists in almost every city I can think of. And so it's yeah. recognizing that we may be kind of one of the early people to start doing this and doing this at scale, but you know, it's going to be a big, big trend over the coming decades. And the people who can really own this space and capture some of the intellectual property and understand the complexities around it, I think have got a, a, a good runway ahead of them. Brilliant. Brilliant. You, you mentioned that you, you are a trained architect. Are you, do you have a background in business as well, or did you just sort of launch into this? Yeah, so I, I, I studied just my undergraduate at, um, at UCL at the Bartlett and then went from there to straight away go and set up a renewable energy business called BioBean. And that's a business Brilliant. that is, if you're, it's going to sound even more wacky to your listeners after hearing about Strong, <laughs> but this is a business that, uh, <laughs> that uh, takes used coffee grounds and uh, converts them and transforms them into a range of advanced biofuels and biochemicals. So we manufacture biomass pellets, which you use for heating homes and, uh, in fact, used in instant coffee factories to power instant coffee factories. Then we uh, manufacture something called coffee logs. So we're now going into summer, but if it was in winter, you might be wanting to use those as a sustainable alternative to wood or coal to heat your home and your wood-burning nice. stove at home. And then we make a small amount of biodiesel. So a few years ago, we did a big campaign, for example, creating the first ever coffee-powered bus. So Transport for London's red buses were for a time running on coffee drive biodiesel from our factories. And then also we make uh, advanced biochemicals, which are the stuff I'm actually most excited about, because they're, but they're very, very weird. So this, So when you make a coffee, what you're actually drinking is flavoured coffee water. So the coffee grounds are right. 
uh, left behind, but you pour over hot water, which acts as a solvent and extracts something called the volatile aroma compounds from that. And those volatile aroma compounds are the stuff that makes coffee taste and smell like coffee. But right. if you were to pour over hot water on the grounds after you've done that once, you would get a slightly less strong coffee. You get kind of a yeah. weak blend of coffee. But because what we've done with BioBean is we actually control a vast amount of the UK's used coffee grounds, you know, tens of thousands of tons a year from instant coffee factories and coffee shops, all of which contain this amazing stuff, these compounds, all of which are essentially making weak cups of coffee. <laughs> and what we've done is we've developed the technology, the, the biochemistry and the technology to be able to extract these volatile aroma compounds, condense them, bring them together into these very, very intense it's what, in essence, coffee flavor and fragrances. And then we work with coffee flavor and fragrance, work with flavor and fragrance companies to reintroduce those into the safely to a kosher standard, to a food grade standard, right. into the food supply chain or the flavor supply chain again. So back into things wow. like coffee cakes, uh, coffee flavorings, coffee ice cream, that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very niche area of um, the circular economy and yeah. uh, kind of biochemistry, but really interesting. I have to ask, do the uh, coffee logs release a, a smell of coffee when you burn them? They they sadly, well, because we've taken all the good, all the, yeah. all the smell and taste out, sadly they don't. But it was something that we've, we, but interestingly, we still get some of the reviews on, you know, that's there for sale in like B&Q and Waitrose and Amazon and stuff. And we still get some of the reviews who say, oh, a delicious coffee aroma for my home. And it's, like, <laughs> it's totally their brain telling them that. But uh, so no, you don't. Totally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I um, there was a report. It was reported recently that um, now uh, wood wood fired uh, stoves and heaters cause more particulate matter pollution than vehicles do, um, because wow. basically over the last sort of twenty years, there's been a big drive to stop using you know the most polluting uh, v- vehicle fuels that are you know, the worst for particulate matter. But sort of under the radar, nobody has been regulating wood burning stoves and so, and they've grown in popularity because they're they're kind of quite a cool thing people feel like they're quite uh i don't know they're quite homey and and sort of traditional and so that has you know as a trend in in just you know people's interior design or whatever has just you know skyrocketed and apparently is a really really big problem in cities in terms of air pollution now no it's a it's a, it's a huge issue and it's one of the unusual things that you know the clean air act in 1952 or whenever it was was obviously in response to industrial uses in cities and burning coal for both industrial uses and heating and obviously the great smog and everything that came from that and so we've had a you know decades of cleaning up cities but then yeah the kind of hipster reintroduction of of wood burning stoves and all the rest of it has um all the higger introduction of wood burning stoves has really gone in the direction there it's particularly bad with wood and particularly non-dried wood, um, and also your type of stove. So if you're if you're using oh, a right. if you're using a, a clean sustainable fuel and or a high quality stove, it hugely it doesn't re- eliminate particular matter, but it means that it's at least under the Clean Air Act regulations, and so that's really where the, the focus is as a sustainable, renewable alternative to wood and coal. Because if you can believe it, yeah. there's still a lot of people in the UK who burn coal as their sometimes even their primary source of fuel. Yeah, well, it, well, in Ireland, a lot of people still use, uh, still go to the bog and cut peat, you know, and dry it out and bring it home, yeah. and they have a store, uh, which is just, you know, it's just bonkers when you think about it. And it's sort of a, it's sort of a tradition that has lived on, and people sort of like it as a, you know, gathering your own fuel source and everything. But it's like we really can't be can't be doing this yeah. anymore in the 21st yeah. century. Yeah. Well, and in, in, we're, we're, we're stocked in, I think, quite probably a few dozen places in Ireland, including Bewley's in Dublin. So we're, oh, yeah. we're you know, over the other side of the RSC. Brilliant. <laughs> and and you mentioned as well, just because I wasn't actually expecting to talk about BioBean at all, but I'm so fascinated in it now. I'm going to keep going. Um, the uh, You said the vehicle fuels that you can produce, is that a, a diesel sort of an alternative to diesel can that can that be used in any ve- any diesel vehicle or does it need to be adapted exactly so it's a it's an it's a biodiesel it's called a second generation biodiesel which means that typically biodiesels are generated from uh crops so you'd grow a, a seed a field of crops and then you'd harvest it for uh, the biodiesel uh, oily crops okay and um this is a second generation biodiesel which means it's derived from a waste stream so typically yeah um you know, coffee grounds have a 
oil, a very high percentage of oil between 15 and 20% by weight. And so that oil can be extracted and converted using a process called transesterification from coffee oil into biodiesel. And then uh, at the moment in the EU, typically around between 5 and 10% of your normal fuel, if you're just going to go to a fuel pump, is made up of biodiesel. Um, and so this can be mm-hmm. either used as, okay. a, as a pure play coffee biodiesel or blended in to your standard diesel as a renewable, um, to, again, to dis- displace a portion of it. So our real niche there is okay. um, using eco fuels or fuels derived from waste as displacers of conventional fuels because a lot of sustainability solutions sound great on paper but they rely, rely, require an entirely new infrastructure in order to make them actually useful the most famous yeah. example obviously being electric cars that you need not only a new car but also a whole very complex electric vehicle battery supply chain plus a whole network of yeah. charging points so it's a really cool thing and yeah. amazing idea but it's unbelievable you know in the trillions and trillions of dollars to convert the world from you know, liquid fuels to electric yeah. and then you still have the infrastructure and the cost of a carbonized supply chain let alone the supply chain cost of a full life cycle assessment on a, on a battery or whatnot and so our real niche and this again it's as with skyrim it's not a silver bullet it's a part of the solution not the entire solution is to say yeah use existing infrastructure but let's find sustainable alternatives that can be used today to replace um, dirty fuels and critically at the same price or cheaper. Yeah, I mean, there, there really is no silver bullet in sustainability, but what there is is lots of little innovations and changes that add up together, you know, and, and I think the, the first episode of this podcast I did actually was a summary of um, the Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales, uh, have a yep. report called Zero Carbon Britain, where they set out how basically the, the United Kingdom could go carbon neutral using existing technology. And one of the things that I learned, you know, going through that is that, you know, okay, we can generate a lot of power with wind, a little bit with solar, you know, a little bit with tidal energy, but these are not uh, reliable. They're not there. You know, you, you can't store, well, it's difficult to store them. You can't just, you know, pump it out as, as a liquid. So we will need these biofuels and these sort of alternatives as a smaller percentage of our overall energy, you know, renewable energy structure to go carbon neutral. So it's absolutely essential. Exactly. And it's, it's very, very easy to hide behind reports and to say it's not perfect. Mm. And I think the sustainability movement, often actually the same with a lot of social justice movements, is that they sacrifice completed and good in lieu of a hopeful, perfect future. Right. And sadly, a lot of these things are just like, okay, it's definitely not going to be, we're not going to be 100% renewable tomorrow, but it's yeah. better we get 2% less um, pollution, less pollution into the air or less CO2 into the atmosphere today and then work incrementally towards it. And so what is typically referred to as transition fuels or transition solutions to the climate emergency, I believe are incredibly important to actually make a change that happens now. Um, others will disagree with me. I'm sure you'll get <laughs> people saying, you know, we need a much more dramatic uh, answer. But in terms of understanding the political, let alone the social and economic reality, is that I think that's the way that um, is the only way to actually make a change. So for the final question, I like to ask all my guests the same thing. Um, and I always get a different answer, which is <laughs> the best thing. Basically, we're, we're at a very pivotal, pivotal moment right now with regard to taking action on climate change. Um, so from your perspective, what needs to change or what would you like to see happening over the coming decades as we address the climate crisis? And this can be about anything, could be about architecture or technology or anything at all. My two would be move to cities for your own carbon footprint and then make sure you don't pull down buildings but you find ways if possible to live in existing ones and make sure you can retrofit them effectively if necessary yeah but it's around under i mean i'd say the first that would be really understand the 
the data behind it and understand what where the actual impact is rather than what you're told by me or frankly anyone else what the the impact is go and kind of you know read the research and understand the the full supply chains of some of the things out there it's often demist it's often quite mystifying intentionally and then from that i believe that the way is to yeah live in urban centers and um manage existing buildings really really well that's brilliant that's great um i think i definitely have to do a podcast on this urban versus rural you know carbon footprint thing because i think that is so so overlooked um yeah so yeah I'm, i might have to ask you for some uh some, <laughs> some, oh, for, i've got so much i've got links. so much a lot of links and reading on subjects so i'd love to send something to you because it's um it's it's interestingly it is my most invite the people who are most passionate about it are the most surprised and actually upset about it because it's a very it's a big <laughs> narrative change and so it's yes even if you say like I've had people say, oh, but I feel so bad living in London. I'm like, how can we talk about environmental stuff? I'm like, no, no, this is exactly where you need to be living is in dense cities. But um, very, very counterintuitive, which is why people struggle with it. And genuinely, big environmentalists get upset and angry when they find it out. And <laughs> kind of there's a bit of cognitive dissonance going on. They kind of like still ignore it and talk about the same stuff. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, because it, it does feel like we're living separately to nature we've sort of divorced nature from cities but that's a duality that i i totally reject and i think one of the best things we can do is is actually embracing city or embracing nature and ecology much more in our cities and hopefully can connect people back to nature who are living in dense cities exactly exactly, totally because that is a really confusing idea again that isn't and very complex too i love initiatives like yeah urban wilding, urban rewilding and national park city in london and all there's really interesting conversations around that but it feels very distant um yeah the most the best thing you can do for environment and nature is stay away from it um but also weirdly whilst educating yourself about it so it's a you know very very counterintuitive i think a lot more research needs to be done in terms of that because it's like because the you know when you if you watch a David Attenborough documentary you learn loads of things but you definitely like everyone I think well most people I know wants to then want to go on like a safari or like go and see these things yeah. in real life and it's kind of <laughs> is that you know and then hop on a long haul flight to Chile or Galapagos to go and see the thing so it's it's very unusual but I guess that's part of yes that's the challenge that's a good point isn't it yeah um so Arthur where can so thank you so much for coming on I've, I've learned a lot um from this and i'm definitely going to listen back to it and and you know pick up some notes where can people find out more about you um and skyroom so about me uh not no particular i've got a twitter account so you can look me up on twitter okay um, great and arthur k underscore but more importantly for skyroom and the keywork homes fund you can find it at sky www.skyroom.london and then okay. the fund you can find at fund.skyroom.london. And okay, great. there's kind of a, a, a newsletter there and kind of ways to stay in touch. And if anyone's like an architect or works for a local authority or a housing association, would love to continue the conversation. Brilliant. Well, I'll put links to all that in the podcast description so people can just go on and click on those. Um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, Ross, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me on.